Thank you, Jorge. And this is our last presentation with Connor Falk. He's a full-time numismatist specialized in the United States, Mexican coins and paper money, among other coins. And he joined the company in 2016. He managed consignment, research, cataloging. He does a lot of everything like everybody here. And at this time, he uh, very gently gave us uh, the option to hear him, his presentation on a topic that usually don't hear about it, but it's very interesting. And it's uh, shipwreck paper money. Um, so, Connor, whenever you're ready, it's all yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Augie. And uh, thank you, Jorge, for moderating this. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming out to, to listen to our talks. Uh, certainly, in better times, we would be doing this in person uh, at the hotel in Disney Springs. But we're, we're thankful for where we're at right now and, and certainly excited for the auction to come uh, over the next couple of days here. Uh, so as Augie said, I've been with the company for just over four years now and um, wear many hats uh, doing what I do with the company. But one of the things I do is a uh, catalog, uh, particularly uh, U.S. coins, uh, world coins in general, and paper money. Uh, with paper money, there is an interesting area of collecting that is shipwreck paper money. It's not an area that is talked about. We do a lot of shipwreck coins and shipwreck treasure artifacts, but as I point out, paper money is really uh, an area that isn't talked about as much because there is so much little out there for shipwreck paper money. We'll discuss a little bit about what shipwreck paper money is and how it could survive in wrecks uh, for decades and decades underwater and uh, in those environmental conditions. So we'll start off with my talk, which is Unlikely Survivors, Shipwreck Paper Money. And the question is, how does shipwreck paper money survive a wreck? Uh, in most cases, it depends on a number of different factors. Uh, the key one is temperature. Colder temperatures are going to preserve paper money uh, better than warmer temperatures. You also have to take into account the shipwreck site itself. Is it silty? Is it muddy? These, you know, as much as you would think that silt or mud would damage the notes, they can actually preserve the notes by encasing them and preventing them from being attacked by bacteria or any sort of organism that may eat away at the paper. Uh, even the currents of the shipwreck site can be involved. The way that the water moves and how it tears apart the rack or moves things within the rack can drastically determine how the paper money has survived. How are the notes stored? Uh, if the notes were stored in some sort of case or wooden boxes that may have helped the survival, one of the wrecks that we'll talk about, uh, the wooden cases, when, they were, when the notes were discovered, the wooden cases had completely rotted away, but in doing so, they kept the paper uh, money, the uncut sheets of paper money inside almost nearly intact. So they did their job, and this was after decades of being underwater. Uh, the other question is how soon after the wreck sinking were the notes recovered? In some cases, uh, we'll be talking about wrecks where the notes were found right away, where they were pulled off the wreck site by salvers at the time that the wreck had, had happened. Other times, it has taken several decades before the wreck site has been salvaged for these notes to come up. Uh, the final thing that is, is a really determinant uh, for how paper money survives underwater is what the paper money is made out of. Uh, when we say paper money, it's technically a misnomer. Uh, most banknotes are typically made with a blend of textiles. Uh, for instance, U.S. paper money is made up of 75% cotton and 25% linen. Uh, the cotton balance is actually normally... Uh, made out of recycled denim jeans. So if you think about it, the way that your, your jeans hold up over time is, is very similar to the way that the paper money is going to hold up in, in conditions uh, that are normally detrimental to any sort of wood paper pulp uh, that you know one would uh, think of with paper. So we'll start off with the first wreck uh, that we'll be talking about, and it's actually the most famous of the wrecks to generate paper money, and that is of the Titanic. 
Uh, everybody knows the story of how the Titanic uh, came to sink after striking an iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean on April 14th, late April 14th, uh, 1912. And it sank shortly in the very early hours of April 15th. Uh, 710 survivors on uh, were rescued from the wreck and uh, over 1,500 were lost. And this was due to the vessel not having enough uh, lifeboats for everybody to uh, get on board. And obviously some of the early lifeboats were launched without uh, all the people, that they weren't filled to capacity. So this wreck was a very tragic wreck and it was certainly uh, a blow to see a, such a, a luxury liner, something that was described as being unsinkable, sink beneath the ocean's maiden voyage. It would take several decades before the wreck site was located. In 1985, a joint French and American expedition led by Robert Ballard located the wreck site. Uh, shortly thereafter, the wreck site uh, was salvaged by uh, one company, RMS Titanic Inc. Uh, throughout the years of 1987 into the early 2000s, they were recovering artifacts from the site of the wreck. Uh, one of those items was recovered in 1987 was a leather Gladstone bag, which contained uh, personal effects, jewelry, uh, watches, uh, even coins, but also banknotes. And this bag was opened up on a live televised event, uh, the Return to the Titanic, uh, broadcast in 1987. It is uh, presumed that the combination of the cold water of the wreck site, remember this is a wreck that was around 12,000 feet underwater in the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, that cold water, in addition to the tanning process used on a leather bag, may have contributed to helping these banknotes survive in the ocean for several decades, over 70 years. So what we have here are there's a still on the left from that broadcast return to the Titanic of the leather bag in an aquarium, which was partially filled with some of the original water um, where they had recovered it from. They did this to kind of stabilize it and uh, to keep it uh, intact as they opened up the bag on live television and started removing the artifacts from it uh, to display to, to show off to several different experts uh, there on the, the televised event. And then to the right, we have a uh, sharper image of the, uh, of the bag itself. These are more stills from the broadcast where bundles of blackened banknotes were pulled up out of this bag and put into plastic trays. And then the experts would have to go through and slowly peel all the notes off of each other. One of the experts on the televised event described it as interesting in that most of the notes that they were pulling out of the bag were American notes. This expert had expected that uh, English notes would be most predominant, but uh, apparently this was not the case with this particular bag. It's presumed that the contents of the bag may have been one of the purser's safes, that it was a, a combination of items that had been trusted to one of the purser's and while the ship was sinking, the purser had removed the items from the safe into a bag with the intention of possibly offloading it from the ship. But uh, it's presumed that the uh, purser involved was lost on the wreck. So the first note that we'll look at here is a $20 national bank note from the First National Bank of Eureka, California. Uh, this one survived relatively intact. It has a little bit of rust staining on it, a little bit of uh, edge degradation from the salt water immersion, uh, but it is still fully legible. In fact, the serial numbers are legible. Uh, the signatures that would be along the bottom uh, are not visible anymore, but that's probably you know just due to the immersion in the water. Um, so continuing on from there, we look at another national bank note and, and keep in mind with national bank notes that these were notes um, generated by banks that were approved by the federal government to issue paper money in their name. So when we see these different names, Eureka, California, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that these came from those exact locales. They may have circulated around. But in a way, it does certainly speak to the people that were on board the uh, luxury liner at the time. One has to wonder, you know, why is there a California note and a Colorado note in there? Uh, knowing that some of the first class passengers uh, were involved in mining, it is possible that maybe these notes uh, came from some mining magnet who was traveling uh, to Europe and back again and uh, taking their, their return trip on the Titanic. So we, we have the Colorado, the first national bank of Colorado Springs, uh, $10 national bank note here. And again, uh, you see a lot of rust staining on here, some blackish staining on there, but very legible uh, and really just an amazing survivor uh, from the wreck. Uh, this one's probably the best uh, note to come off the Titanic that I could find. Uh, this is a $10 uh, National Bank note, uh, Series 1902 uh, from the Berwyn National Bank of Pennsylvania. Uh, just I mean, you can see that it looks pretty much as you would expect to find, you know, any other banknote, uh, non-rec uh, banknote, with maybe a little bit of staining in there, but but certainly everything is fully legible and a very impressive uh, note to come off the wreck. And here we see a $10 national bank note from the National Bank of Merrill, Wisconsin. Uh, you can see a little bit of degradation on that one, but still, you know, very, very nicely visible. Definitely uh, was something that maybe came out of that bag uh, blackened and, and just really not visible. But then over time, as they conserved it, it revealed the, the notes uh, surfaces. This is an image that a little bit, you know, low res. I had to pull this one off the internet, but uh, I thought it was an interesting one. It's from the Manufacturer's National Bank of Newark, New Jersey. It's a $5 national bank note. And uh, very, very similar appearance to the other notes that we've seen. Now here's a $5 silver certificate, uh, in series 1899. Um, still, still quite legible and uh, still a, a very uh, nice survivor. Very, uh, it has the similar paper content as the national banknotes that we were looking at. So it's going to survive in a very similar way as those other ones. Here's another example of a $5 silver certificate, series 1899. And then we have a $5 United States note, uh, the uh, wood chopper uh, note from 1907. Uh, very, very sharp edges, really no degradation, just mainly staining on this one. So, you know, just very nicely uh, visible all throughout. There's a $1 silver certificate, series 1899, Black Eagle. Uh, just, you can see all the staining across it, but still, you know, just really impressive. There's another one of the same type. And, uh, you know, we talk about some of the foreign notes that could have been on the Titanic. And, and certainly in, in my study, I could not find any English notes, really, uh, that were recovered from the wreck. But what I did find was several Canadian notes. And that would make sense. There were some Canadian passengers on board the ship. Uh, here we have a $20 Canadian Bank of Commerce uh, note from 1902. Survived uh, really, really impressively. Uh, uh, well for the wreck. And then here's a $5 note from the Bank of Nova Scotia dated to September 1st, 1908. You can see it, besides the staining, uh, it looks pretty much as made. And then certainly being such a later dated note, uh, when the wreck went down, this note really probably only had maybe about three to four years of circulation. So when it went down, it came back up pretty much as it was when it, when somebody last held it in their hands. Uh, here we have a Belgian note, uh, 20 francs note, dated to May 12, 1911. It has some uh, edge degradation and some staining throughout it, but still you know, fully legible, including the serial numbers. And then we have a French 100 francs note, dated to May 8, 1909. 
Uh, this one seems to have suffered a little bit more degradation than the others, but uh, most of the design is still present. So now we're going to move on to the next wreck, which is the SS Camberwell, sank in May 18, 1917. Uh, it struck a mine left by U-36, uh, 58 survivors, and seven were lost when a lifeboat that was being dropped into the waters uh, overturned and capsized. Its cargo consisted mainly of trade goods, including olive oil, wine, cement, fertilizer, uh, postcards for British troops over in India, so that way they could send them back to their loved ones in England, uh, were on board, uh, along with a consignment of unsigned Indian 10 rupees notes. Uh, these notes were kept unsigned, partially as a security measure uh, that they would be Le they would leave from London where they're printed, and when they arrive in India, they would be signed by the government officials uh, involved in their issuance. The notes and the postcards were recovered in the 1970s by diver Martin Woodward. Uh, Woodward described the notes coming up from the wreck uh, in just like a big black mass, uh, all smushed together and encrusted, uh, and that they really had to be peeled apart to reveal the notes on the inside. So we see here, we see examples of the Indian 10 rupees um, dated to November 25th, 1916. This one has its full serial number still visible. All of the notes from the SS Camberwell that I've seen have this similar circular edge degradation. They're all like that, that the interior part is, has been kept for the most part as made but uh, due to the water immersion, the outer edges have uh, been lost. And there is some staining throughout some of the notes, as you'll see. Here we see two more, again, a very similar pattern of degradation and, and a little bit of staining on there, but still uh, very impressive that, that you have to think that these were in the English Channel for, at that point, uh, close to 60 years and yet they had, they had survived as well as they did. So the next wreck that we'll talk about is the SS Shirala, it sunk shortly after the Camberwell, July 2nd, 1918. Uh, it was torpedoed by U-boat 557, uh, 205 survivors uh, and eight persons lost on the wreck. The cargo is very similar to the Camberwell, uh, consisted of trade goods, wine, vehicle parts, binoculars, telescopes, ivory, detonating camps, mail, and a uh, consignment of Indian rupee notes. Uh, this wreck is probably the one that's going to be the, uh, when you have to consider that the Titanic, you won't be able to own the notes from the Titanic, uh, the Shirala is probably the second uh, one that will be the most uh, rare in terms of notes uh, to come off of it. That if you're looking to collect them, they will come up once in a while. Uh, I, looking through records, have only been able to find two in recent times, and we'll take a look at one of them. Uh, but the list of the notes on board was more varied. Uh, these included signed one rupee notes of King George V, and some of the prefixes are documented. However, this is not to say that they're exclusive to the wreck, meaning that some of the prefixes uh, were already in India and circulating at the time, whereas others were on board the wreck and were lost. Uh, the rest of the notes include unsigned five and 10 rupee notes uh, with various dates, as you can see there, through 1915 and 1918. Uh, very little is known about the salvage of these notes from the wreck. Uh, it's possible that they were either removed from the wreck uh, shortly after it was sinking, maybe in the years uh, for, uh, following that. Uh, it's also considered that maybe some of them were washed up along the English Channel on the beaches there. Uh, as I point out, examples are very rare. This note that we're looking at right now is a unsigned five rupees note from the wreck. It, um, has some staining, but has kept up its shape and its condition very well. And it's it's a really an example of how something can survive underwater um, with minimal damage. 
The next wreck that we'll talk about is the SS Egypt, and that sank on May 20th, 1922, after a collision. Um, we actually have a really interesting image here that was made around the time showing uh, what the salvage would have looked like. Uh, this was a very technologically advanced salvage for the time. They used a rudimentary um, armored diver suit that they dropped down from the salvage vessel, which had arms that they were able to help guide the giant crane uh, with its claw. They were able to guide it down onto the side of the wreck and have it remove uh, the layers of the ship to get down to the strong room on board where they could access the, the notes that were on board. Um, it, it, sank in, in the English Channel after a collision with the sign. Uh, 266 survivors uh, survived the, the wreck and 86 were lost uh, due to the rapid sinking of the vessel, sank less than 20 minutes. The wreck site was located in 1930 at, uh, at a depth of 560 feet, which was a, a very deep um, uh, dive for the time. The, the technology uh, would definitely not allow any scuba divers to reach that limit, but as I said, they, they created a rudimentary diving suit that allowed somebody to go down to the wreck site, go down to that depth, and help guide the salvage crane to its, its site. So as they removed the layers from the wreck and they uncovered the uh, strong room, they then had to recover all these bars of gold and silver bullion. That was their main goal. That's what they were after initially, was the gold and silver bullion on board. They also had bags of gold sovereigns, which uh, shortly after the wreck, either the bags had disintegrated or been torn during the salvage operation, but they had split open and their cargo, the, the, the gold sovereigns had spread across the strong room and had ended up in all the muck and the silt that had built up in the room over the years. Uh, so what they did uh, to recover these sovereigns from the wreck site was they, they sent down a large tube with a glass plating in front of it. And they put it down into the muck and they shattered the, the glass. And this created a vacuum up through the tube that sucked up all the, 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 the debris, the, the silt, the mud, but also the gold sovereigns. And it, it sucked them up, and they they brought it aboard the the the, the salvage vessel. And when they were sorting through this and pulling the sovereigns out, they also noticed that they were pulling up bundles of Hyderabad uh, five, ten, and hundred rupee notes uh, within there. That apparently a cargo on board of these notes had also been stored in the in the strong room and was being recovered as they were trying to pull up the gold and the silver. So this was entirely unknown to them that they'd be able to find this at the time, uh, but they did. And they started pulling these up thinking that these notes would have some exchange value, that the salvers could redeem the notes or somehow work a deal out with the government. Well, as it turned out that those notes, um, they were never issued, they were unsigned. So much like the Indian notes from before, they weren't official notes yet and thus they weren't eligible for redemption or exchange, so the salvers uh, weren't able to get any money for them. Uh, so instead they had to rely on their very successful salvage of the bullion bars and the gold coins on board. The, the remainder of the notes were, uh, that were recovered were brought over to London, um, or a good a majority of the notes recovered were brought to London and burned. Uh, others were actually stamped or indicated that they had come from the SS Egypt uh, and given away or held on to as souvenirs from the wreck. We'll take a look at one of those now. Here's one from the wreck. It's a Hyderabad five rupees note. And uh, there's, um, there's an inscription on the front of it that possibly indicates it's, um, you know, possibly from one of the salvers on board that indicates that they had recovered it and possibly kept it in their uh, collection or as a souvenir of their time on the wreck. Uh, PMG has graded this note as a VF-25 net sea salvage. Uh, this note is quite scarce. Uh, it's very difficult to find any notes from the SS Egypt in any condition, even though that they note that the note itself was repaired and that it had pieces added. Uh, is still a very uh, impressive rarity to come from the wreck. Uh, very few SS Egypt notes have appeared on auctions over the past couple of years. 
And um, it, it's certainly one that will be quite difficult if you're looking to put together a collection of shipwreck paper money. Our next uh, shipwreck is the SS Breda, sinking on December 24th, 1940. It was attacked by German bombers on December 23rd, while off anchor um, off of Alban, Scotland, as part of a convoy that was uh, set to leave from that site. Uh, two bombers actually dropped bombs along either side of the vessel, and it created enough damage that the ship took on water and was unable to go under its own power, so it was taken into tow. It was beached into a bay nearby where they started recovering some of the cargo on board, but a day later, a storm struck and the ship was knocked off of the, uh, the bay or the sandbar that it was on and sank into deeper waters, 85 feet deep. So cargo consisted of trade goods in addition to British military wear, such as biplanes, military trucks, and a consignment of Indian five and 10 rupees notes. The, um, the notes were not actually printed at this time, but these were actually um, uncut sheets of banknote paper. This was paper that would have been printed later. Uh, so what you have is uncut sheets that have the watermark of King George V um, and, and the Reserve Bank of India on them. They were recovered, uh, these uncut sheets were recovered in the late 1980s and early 1990s by local divers. Uh, they can be easily purchased today. You can, you have the option of purchasing uncut sheets, which we'll look at here now. These are uncut sheets recovered from the SS Breda. They're readily available on the market. Uh, just looking at several different sites, you can find some trending for about the $150 range that you can get an uncut sheet. Uh, some have taken to taking the uncut sheets and trimming them to banknote size uh, to sell individually. Uh, note that this was done after the salvage and purely the cargo consists of uncut sheets, but these trimmed down notes uh, that were trimmed afterwards, uh, generally you, you can pick them up anywhere between 15 to $25 each. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're blank sheets of, of un, um, unprinted uh, paper, but here's what the watermark underneath would look like when you have one up to the light. And certainly the, the sheets uh, survived quite phenomenally well for the, the, the time. The, this was the case where they were stored in, in wooden crates and the wood had disintegrated by the time that the sheets had been found but the notes themselves had been protected quite well and only suffered a little bit of staining and some ed, uh, edge degradation. The next uh, vessel that we'll talk about is the SS Politician sank on February 4th 1941. And I say sank on February 4th, but technically it ran aground and was partially flooded on that date. It struck a rock off Eriske, Scotland and took water. And within hours of it being uh, abandoned by its crew, uh, locals had already visited the ship and had started salvaging uh, the cargo, which predominantly was that of Scotch whiskey. Uh, there, was, there were 22,000 crates of whiskey on board, amounting to about 264,000 bottles of Scotch whiskey. And being that the locals were under wartime uh, conditions, they were certainly uh, eager to have some whiskey uh, available to them. So that was the predominant cargo on board that uh, actually lends to the popularity of the SS politician. The wreck uh, was so popular for the story behind it that the locals were illegally salvaging the Scotch whiskey under cover of night using their own fishing boats. Uh, that actually led to a novel in 1947 called Whiskey Galore by Compton McKenzie and two British comedy films, one in 1949 and then a remake in 2016 uh, talking about a, a similar uh, story to the wreck in this in the novel and in the movies they describe it as the SS cabinet minister but it's clearly the story of the SS politician that they are uh, making fun of. In addition to the whiskey on board the ship contained a consignment of Jamaican banknotes uh, 10 shillings one pound notes and 10 pound notes. Some of the notes were covered by the salvers and were recycled 
Others were taken from the wreck and kept as souvenirs or attempted to be exchanged at banks in several different countries. We know that banks in Scotland, England, Malta, the United States, Jamaica, all reported that some of the notes that were on board the ship were attempted to be redeemed for legitimate uh, money. And certainly, uh, you know, how they came to circulate around unofficially uh, spoke to the illegal salvage uh, that occurred on the wreck at the time. The wreck from the rock site was refloated and towed a short distance away from the site uh, where they put it on a sandbar. But when it was upon that sandbar in, in late 1941 at this point, it broke in two. And from there, they had a whole nother issue of how to deal with it from there. The back half of the ship where most of the water was and the stern section and cargo number five kept that area down. So they proceeded to cut the ship in half, leaving the stern and the cargo hold number five behind and taking the front half of the SS politician to a scrap yard and scrapping it from there. Uh, in fact, the remainder of the SS politician wreck does yield uh, some whiskey bottles, uh, I think as late as the 1980s. Uh, some divers have reported recovering whiskey from the wreck, uh, still sealed and still uh, apparently drinkable, I guess. So here we have a 10 shillings note from the SS politician shipwreck, graded by PMG as UNC 62. And they note the SS politician shipwreck pedigree on there. And here's the reverse of the note. You can see it survived mostly intact. Um, this is probably something that was recovered around the time or shortly thereafter it was uh, sunk and you know only incurred some staining on it and then was kept as a souvenir or uh, you know somebody was hoping to exchange it for legitimate money. The next vessel that we'll talk about is the SS City of Roubaix, sank in eight, on April 6, 1941. It, started on fire after a German Luftwaffe attack on the harbor of Piraeus, Greece. The Germans had started the invasion of Greece when the uh, SS City Roubaix was at harbor. And it was alongside a British vessel, the SS Clan Fraser. The Luftwaffe bombers, knowing that the vessel, the Clan Fraser, was in the harbor, proceeded to bomb it, starting the Clan Fraser on fire which then set the SS city of Roubaix on fire. Uh, shortly thereafter being set on fire, the ships exploded in the harbor, uh, launching shrapnel and cargo up into the sky. Uh, locals noted that some of the banknotes that were apparently on board the SS city of Roubaix were flying down from the sky and piling up in the streets, and then also washing up in the harbor as the waves came in, that the notes were free from their, their cases and been blown sky high. Uh, the cargo consisted of 50 cruise notes and 100 lira bound for Turkey. Uh, these notes were recovered by a lot of locals and unofficially circulated in Turkey. Uh, this was um, something that they tried to crack down on and, and stop their illegal circulation, but uh, the northern provinces of Turkey did see uh, Greek merchants come in and uh, exchange the notes that, uh, you know, for other money that they could um, use elsewhere. Uh, the notes officially recovered from the wreck site were recycled, and it is the unofficially circulated notes that we have as reminders or that we have available to us on the market. The 100 lira is very rare, and more often than not, you're going to find the 50 kurus as an example from the wreck. Here is one that we have actually in this auction coming up tomorrow as lot 405. It's a Turkish 50 cruise, graded PMG AU50. And on the back side, it's noted that it's from the SS City Roubaix. The next wreck that we'll talk about is the SS or the Andre Doria, sunk in July 26, 1956. Uh, here we have an image of the wreck as it was floundering uh, in the ocean off of Nantucket. And then we have a painting by Ken Marshall of the wreck site circa 1980s, 1990s. Um, told that by divers now that go down to the wreck nowadays that much of the wreck has deteriorated 
and that the front part, the bow uh, of the ship just uh, forward of the bridge has broken off and um, is scattered apart in the wreck site there. So the Andre Doria sank several hours after a collision with the Stockholm while it was en route to New York City. Uh, the Stockholm remained afloat and actually rescued some of the Andre Doria survivors from the wreck. Unfortunately, 46 lives were lost on the, on the Andrea Doria, mainly in the collision, and uh, of three of them as the evacuation was occurring. Uh, thankfully, 1,660 passengers and crew were rescued from the wreck. It was um, a wreck that spent several hours floundering before finally sinking on July 26 in the early morning hours. Within 24 hours of the wreck, uh, reaching the bottom of the ocean. Divers had already reached it and started documenting it. It wasn't until 1981, though, that Peter Gimbel uh, launched an expedition to recover the first-class bank safe. Their intention was that the safe would contain jewelry and uh, watches and other valuables that the passengers had entrusted the purser on board with um, uh, keeping watch over. However, in 1984, the safe was opened on live television and it was found that what was inside were only bundles of banknotes, blackened banknotes, uh, that the jewelry on board had been removed as the ship was less than 24 hours out from its uh, docking at New York City. Most of the passengers had recovered their valuables and thus what was left on board were banknotes and traveler's checks. Notes uh, recovered include predominantly $1 silver certificates and Italian 1,000 lira notes. There are very small amounts of uh, some other countries' notes and some other denominations, which we'll, we'll go through here. Uh, the Gimbals uh, had the foresight to, to really make uh, lemonade out of the lemons that they've been given with the safe and took the notes, conserved them, put them in lucite blocks, and put them together as uh, promotional items, the souvenirs that people that could own. These were marketed in the late 1980s. Uh, a number were sold in that time, uh, but a good amount uh, were not sold until you know, the 2000s. In 2003, the remainder of the unsold notes were graded by what was then PCGS currency, what is now legacy currency. Uh, they assigned grades to them based on the quality of the note, its staining, the edge degradation, and how the salt water had affected it. Because of the marketing done for Andre Doria banknotes, is probably the most popular and the most readily available of shipwreck paper money that you can own. Examples of silver certificates from the wreck uh, can typically range between $100 for the radius, the most eaten away ones, upwards of several hundred for particularly rare examples or particularly high grade examples, which we'll see shortly. Uh, a thousand lira notes can be readily had. They recovered several thousand of them. And these are generally, they can be between about the 100 to $150 range, depending on the quality of the note. Here we have some stills of what the recovery looked like. Uh, the one on the left is uh, the safe opening from the live televised event. Uh, what they did was they took a net to recover the bundles of the banknotes as they floated up to the surface of the safe, which was still filled with the water as it had been recovered. And then to the right, we see Peter Gimbel with his wife, Elga Anderson, uh, sitting in front of trays filled with stacks and stacks of notes uh, as they've been found from the safe. Here we have a promotional shot of the safe before it was opened. Um, when they recovered it, they brought it to New York City and placed it, uh, suspended it in the shark tank at the New York City Aquarium. This was partially done in their words to preserve the notes and keep it in relatively same condition as they had been found. But given the promotion uh, involved, it's also definitely an advertisement for uh, the, the live televised event and what they had found. They were certainly excited over that. And by putting it in a very prominent location, they were, they were pointing out that they had recovered the safe of the Andrew Doria. So here we look at uh, a $2 note from the Andrew Doria. Uh, and these are very rare from the wreck. I, I myself have only seen three of them. 
would not be surprised if there were a few more out there, but certainly they do not come up at, at all, really. Um, uh, we have had the pleasure of auctioning uh, several. Uh, so far, we have only sold one so far, and we have two coming up in this next sale. So this is one that we offered in our auction 26, is lot 312. And like a lot of the shipwreck notes that we've looked at, again, it, it exhibits a, a circular pattern of degradation that these bundles, these center parts were preserved because of, they were held together by bands and by the other notes uh, with them. And it was really the edges that were lost to the ocean water. Uh, they also do tend to exhibit some sort of wavy dark stain as you can see throughout here. And then also some rust stain from the safe that they were in. So here's an example of a $2 uh, legal tender note, series 1953. That's in our upcoming sale tomorrow as lot 406. This is pedigreed to the Bart Malone collection. And uh, in this upcoming sale, we have the pleasure of offering uh, just over 20 uh, notes from the Andre Doria pedigreed to the Bart Malone collection. He was a uh, shipwreck diver and the past curator of the New Jersey Maritime Museum. Uh, he collected a lot of shipwreck ephemera and certainly Andrea Doria uh, was very um, uh, big in his collection. He had done over 180 dives on the wreck and uh, certainly was fascinated with the wreck and, and what could be found on it. So he collected many of these notes that Peter Gimbel had recovered. And here we see the back side of the $2 note. It's in this next auction. Here's a high grade, a very high grade example of a $1 silver certificate from the wreck. Uh, this was in our auction 24 as lot 652. Uh, PCGS uh, in 2003, when they graded the Andrea Doria notes that had been unsold to that point, they assigned them three different grades based on their condition. Grade A was considered the finest note. These were notes that by their definition were 95% intact and exhibited very little staining or degradation. Grade B, you're gonna range between 70% to 95% intact. These are gonna have a few more holes, uh, a little bit more staining to them. And then grade C was the lotus grade that they assigned to notes recovered from the wreck. These were notes that were heavily affected by the ocean water immersion and by their, their conditions of being in the safe. Here's the back side of the note. And frankly, it looks like you could still spend it to this day. Uh, here we see a rarity from the wreck, and that is a star note, a $1 silver certificate star note from the wreck. Uh, PCGS graded this one uh, with their B grade, but in, in my opinion, it's closer to that of an A grade, given the quality and, and the, the light staining and, and degradation on it. This was in our auction 22 as lot 501. Here is the reverse of that note. I myself, uh, just looking, having dealt with Andrea Dorian notes for a couple of years, uh, have only seen a handful of star notes from the wreck and in various qualities. Here we look at what is the earliest note from the Andrea Doria. This is a series 1928B $1 silver certificate uh, funny back note. You can see here it's called the funny back because of its interesting uh, $1 reverse design. This is the earliest one that I've seen recovered from the Andrea Doria. Uh, this one's coming up in our next sale tomorrow as lot 407. And uh, certainly a rarity from the wreck. I haven't seen any others uh, like this one. Here is a $1 silver certificate series 1935C. Uh, the series 1935C is, is pretty uncommon from the wreck. Um, we've handled, I think, at this point, about three or four of them. The vast majority of the silver certificates on the Andrea Doria were that of the series 1935E the most recent issuance of uh, silver certificates uh, closest to the Andrea Doria's sinking. But certainly some of the earlier notes, some of the older notes uh, were still in circulation at the time. And this is an example of that. 
And you can see it still exhibits some of the circulation uh, evidence from it folds and it, you know, from being wallets and being traded around uh, before the wrecks, uh, before the wreck was uh, lost. Here's the reverse of the note. Also on board the wreck were American Express travelers checks, that those going from the United States to Italy, to Europe, could take their checks and having signed them could uh, redeem them if they so choose at various locales. Uh, traveling back aboard the wreck uh, or back aboard the ship, their uh, checks would have been stashed aboard the safe. And here we see one that is clearly signed by passenger Mary Gomez. You can see both the signatures there. And this is a phenomenal condition for the American Express checks, more often than not possibly to do with the uh, paper. Unlike the silver certificates, they tend to be heavily stained and be heavily degraded and, and have some edge damage about them. This one is certainly the best uh, that I've, I've encountered and, and certainly the signature, the very clear signature is uh, very impressive. This is coming up in tomorrow's sales lot 411. Here's the reverse of that traveler's check. As I mentioned, the Italian 1,000 lire notes are also very common from the Andrea Doria. Here is one that is a phenomenal condition for the wreck. Uh, more often than not, the Italian 1,000 lire tend to be heavily degraded around the edges. They tend to be very pitted too. They, they have very uh, large interior holes from the salt water um, degradation. This one is, is quite phenomenal for having pretty much all of its uh, design still visible and is probably one of the better ones that uh, I've seen come off the wreck. And this one is also coming up in tomorrow's sales lot 417. Here's the reverse of the note. And you can see it's still displaying a lot of the original ink colors uh, as it was uh, originally made. Here's a bit of a rarity in terms of Italian banknotes from the Andrea Doria. This is a 500 lire. Uh, you don't see these at all. This is the first one that we've encountered. Uh, very beautiful design and certainly a good quality note, uh, despite the uh, edge degradation in the margins. Much of the design is still visible and uh, much of the ink colors are still bright. This one is in our upcoming sales lot 418. And here's the reverse of the note. Uh, this note is a 100 lire note and the 100 and the 50 lire tend to, they tend to be uncommon. Um, I know PCGS currency I think has graded, I think less than 20 of the 100 lire and less than 10 of the 50 lire. Certainly others were sold in the late 1980s as part of the original promotion. So I can't say for sure how many were recovered, but they don't appear all too often uh, from the wreck. And you can see much of the design remains, but they do tend to exhibit uh, heavy degradation for whatever reason, whether it's the paper quality or just the way that they were stored. Here's the reverse of that 100 lire. And then here's the 50 lire. Again, it, very limited quantities of these notes appear on the market, but uh, they, they are out there. This one is coming up in our next sale is lot 1538. There's the reverse of the note. Uh, Canadian notes from the Andrea Doria are certainly among the rarest of the notes from the wreck. And um, I think to this point, we've only seen, uh, only aware of really five of them at this point, um, two of which are in this auction, uh, one of which we've sold prior. And then I'm, I'm aware of uh, possibly two that are held in private collections. Uh, but I do not know the denominations or uh, what what they are exactly. I just know that they're Canadian notes. Uh, this one is an Ottawa Bank of Canada $10 note dated to 1937. It exhibits uh, much degradation and staining around the edges. Much of the interior design is still visible. It has a very strong center fold. So it was uh, certainly in circulation for some time before being lost aboard the wreck. And this is also appearing in our upcoming sales lot 415. 
much of the reverse design is still present, though much of the rust staining from the safe is uh, present on there as well and blocking some of the design. And I should note that that is the first and only uh, note uh, that I've seen like that from the Andrea Doria. This one is a Canadian $10 note uh, of Queen Elizabeth II, dated to 1954. And this has the interesting, um, uh, interesting additional rarity of being a devil's face note in that the um, design was originally made with certain hair curls that uh, people thought resembled that of a devil's face. And there was some talk about it at the time and the design was actually reworked so that the hair curls did not look so ghoulish. Uh, so it's very interesting to have an, a note from the Andrea Doria that in of itself is a rarity and very popular on the market and then uh, on top of that, to have the provenance from the shipwreck. And this is one that we have we handled in the past. And you can see much of the reverse design is still there, but plenty of uh, degradation and, and staining on there. And this is a note that's coming up in our next sales lot 416. It's a Canadian $5 Bank of Canada note. Uh, it is also a devil's face. Uh, a little bit more difficult to see uh, because of the staining and the degradation, but the um, uh, design is still there and it is still uh, part of that very popular variety for Canadian banknote collectors. And here we see the reverse of the note. So the final shipwreck that we'll be talking about is the Aeolian Sky, sank on November 2nd, 1979. Here we have images of the ship uh, before it was sinking, uh, before the accident. And then we have to the right uh, image of the vessel after it had been holding near the bow. It was down uh, and, and barely afloat uh, when they took it under tow. And this is what it would have looked like as they were towing it. Uh, shortly after it was uh, evolved in the collision, it sank on November 4th. Uh, while being towed, and it went off, it went down off of Portland, Bill, Dorset, England. Uh, the vessel, uh, sometime after the vessel sinking in early 1980, uh, on, actually on January 18th, 1980, Dorset police were informed by the insurance uh, underwriters investigating the wreck and and involved in the the wreck adjustment uh, loss. Uh, that a cargo of new Seychelles 100 rupees notes were on board and should be located by the police. The police uh, promptly contracted out divers. They told them that there were certain cases on board the wreck uh, that needed to be recovered. They did not tell them what was exactly inside, but merely roughly the location of where they were on the wreck and where they, uh, that they needed to be recovered. The divers went to the wreck and they were searching the area of the sick bay towards the back part of the vessel where the cases of the notes had been stored for safekeeping. They did not locate the cases in that area. They noted that the wreck, now on its port side, uh, had suffered some damage and that the sick bay door had actually come off of its hinges. And it was speculated that maybe that was how the cases had come to, you know, had come to be removed from the wreck. Uh, it's kind of a mystery exactly of how the cases were lost, though. Um, the notes turned up in fishermen's crab pots uh, shortly after the wreck had occurred. And Dorset police investigated, only finding uh, by reports uh, around 10 or so of them. They noted one fisherman had recovered four sequential notes in his uh, crab fishing pot and turned them into the police and scientific uh, um, investigations into the note itself uh, did note the presence of uh, salt water residue on the note. Uh, despite further attempts to locate the notes after the uh, recovery of some notes by fishermen, the cases were never found despite searching the whole area of the wreck site. They did not find them. A uh, very small amount of the notes were recovered and uh, or were found along the beaches of Dorset. According to the standard catalog of world paper money, the same issuance of the note um, 
was known to actually reach Seychelles um, not on this wreck. So we know that serial numbers one through 300,000 were legitimately circulated and were not from the wreck. But as far as where the 600,000 notes, it is presumed that they are, they represent serial numbers 300,001 through 900,000. And that these were the ones that were on the ship and uh, have yet to, to really be found in any numbers. So it is such a, a very undocumented and mysterious wreck that we only have a non-wreck example of what the note would look like uh, to show it off uh, as. And you can see it's a very colorful note, but uh, as far as what the uh, recovered notes look like, it still remains to be seen. I, I have yet to see one myself, but I know that um, there are a few that have been recovered uh, certainly none that have hit the market. So again, a, another note that will be very rare for anybody looking to assemble a shipwreck paper money collection. So I, uh, I close out my talk now and uh, certainly thank you for, for following along and, and being here with us. Uh, and I'm now open to any questions anybody has. Yeah, thank you, Connor. One sec. Can you hear me there? Thank you, Connor. Um, I have I have two questions. If anybody else want to ask questions, you're welcome to. You can close the presentation now if you want, so they can see you first. Uh, okay. The first question I have is what I think you talk about this a little bit, but. Um, Here's a question. What special steps need to be taken to make sure paper money from shipwreck does not further deteriorate? Well, certainly the main thing is, is drying it out in a way that allows it to um, avoid any sort of above water damage. Because certainly when you remove something that's been in its environment for decades on end, you expose it to an entirely different scenario of being above water. So one would have to dry off the notes and, and certainly if they're bundled together, they'd have to be separated individually. Uh, you'd have to dry off the notes in such a way that doesn't um, wrinkle them or uh, damage them any further. And you also have to prevent them from being damaged by any sort of bacteria or mold or anything that could grow upon them once they've been removed from the water. Okay, thank you, Connor. And the other question I have is how do prices of shipwreck banknotes compare to the same notes not from a shipwreck in general? In a way, like shipwreck coins, having the shipwreck provenance does add a lot to the note. Um, the vast majority of the notes that I showed uh, would be non-wreck examples, would be much, worth much less on the market than those recovered from the shipwreck uh, itself. For instance, I'll note that the silver certificates from the Andrea Doria, the series 1950, uh, 1935E silver certificate can be had for maybe three bucks at most at any coin dealer. But having the shipwreck provenance and the history behind it and the story behind it really adds a value to it. Uh, pretty much in all cases, it's gonna add some value. And really what's determinant is the popularity of the wreck, the uh, story behind it, and also the condition of the note. As you can see, a lot of the notes varied in terms of their, their quality and their, their time spent uh, at the ocean floor. Thank you. And the last question that I have is, if there is any uh, uh, company that specializes in grading shipwreck coins, shipwreck paper money, or uh, they do any work on conserving the, the shipwreck paper money? As far as conservation goes, not to my knowledge. Uh, most of the conservation work that was done, for instance, like on the Andre Doria notes um, or like the SS Camberwell was either done in house or done by contractors. Um, for the most part, there isn't any particular company, but there are other companies out there that would, if say a wreck was found with paper money on board that needed to be conserved, would be able to assist with that. As far as grading shipwreck paper money, um, really what we have are two examples, and that is PMG, that uh, as you see several examples that they have uh, documented the provenance of the shipwreck 
uh, on their their holder. And then uh, PCGS currency, which I know now is uh, now called legacy currency. Uh, they were responsible for the Andre Doria grading. I do not know as far as uh, other projects if they were to grade those, but certainly they were instrumental in the Andre Doria notes. Thank you. And yeah. the last question we have here from Peter, he just asks, how do you, how do conser conservators separate and conserve paper from shipwrecks? Yeah, the, the best way to put it is very carefully. Um, <laughs> certainly when you're when you're dealing with something as, as fragile as what paper money would be like coming out of the ocean, you have to be cautious about how, how you separate it. Um, I know in the return to the Titanic video, um, when they were pulling out the bundles of the paper money from the wreck, these blackened bundles, the experts were, were slowly peeling them apart. And, and certainly one would have to be very cautious about doing that, possibly have some sort of separation tool that allows you to get in between the notes and separate them apart, apart without damaging any notes. Uh, in a way, the make of the paper helps out a lot that having the cotton linen blend of say silver certificates uh, certainly helped when they were conserving the Andre Doria notes. These were notes that for the most part, although they did come out blackened and encrusted, when they removed that, that sort of silt and staining and whatnot, the silver certificate paper was of such high quality that they were able to conserve them quite easily and then put them in their lucite blocks. In fact, I actually have a note here real quick that I'll show you. This is how they did the Andrea Doria promotional material. They did a, a blue box and then they encased the note in a lucite block, a very thick block of lucite and screwed it together so you can see both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, um, we'll, we'll make it a, we'll make it a, a, an ending right now. And thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available for revisiting in the future. And also um, you can email us if you want any of the uh, slideshows or have any questions uh, to the office. And Connor just posted the, his email on the chat. So you can put asking any questions of the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, we did, we finalize the the talks, the three talks that we have from Clyde, Peter, and Connor. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very, very much, Jorge Madonna, uh, that from Argentina. Now it's very late there, time to have dinner. Um, he's been with us hosting and moderating the talks. It was very, very easy. He made it very easy. It was very pleasant. Uh, I'm looking forward to do more of these talks in the future. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow at the auction. We start at 11 a.m. And good luck everybody and thank you for everything, okay? We're gonna finish the recording right now. <laughs>